Thank you for listening to the Conform to Christ podcast, where we seek to engage the mind, affect the heart, and call people to follow Christ. My name is George Mays. With me is Jay Jones, and I'm freezing. <laughs> Good morning, George. <laughs> I'm freezing in here today, Jay. That fall weather my, finally uh, my hit, fingers. <laughs> My fingers are cold, I, and I'm in shorts. I'm wearing and... well. I'm wearing shorts, but when I came in here, I had to put on <laughs> I had to put on my jacket. <laughs> oh man! I'm drinking coffee. It's not. Uh, it's not doing anything. George, some people, you know, they'll collect like some pastors. They'll collect like fancy pins. Have you ever seen that? Mm-hmm. Like they're like I told you before. Like you know how rappers they have bling. Yeah. Right. They they'll invest money and in, like it's like a status symbol, right? Like they have like platinum chains and they'll uh-huh. even go with the big grills, uh-huh. yeah. the platinum teeth and stuff. Mm-hmm. Pastors, it's kind of like fancy pins. Yeah. And then they'll display them in a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know what years will be. <laughs> years will be space heaters. <laughs> George, George show, George's bling is space heaters. Yeah. So, if you guys are looking for a good Christmas present for George, he could always use an extra one. <laughs> oh no! Jay. Maybe what are maybe you doing they to me? could get you some like a. It's Pastor Appreciation Month, you know. <laughs> maybe we could get you uh, one of those new, uh, like those jackets that are have like a battery operated that uh-huh. are heated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there is a very narrow uh, temperature. <laughs> <laughs> that I can that I can just live in comfortably. I mean, there's just a couple of degrees difference <laughs> between me freezing and me burning up. <laughs> you're like you're like a pregnant lady, <laughs> but all the time. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm just like a pregnant lady. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sorry, we can't how say many, we can't many, say that anymore. How many people? How many Birth, people did, birthing persons? Yeah. That's yeah. correct, right? Birthing persons. Oh. How many people did we lose in the first two minutes of the, of the podcast <clears throat> this morning? <laughs> it's all vanity anyways. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, here we are. All right. Well, this Text-driven is... Text-driven Tuesday. Uh, yeah, text-driven Tuesday, and Jay is back in the book of Ecclesiastes. Yep. Um, so, uh, how do you want to set up the sermon? Don't know. I don't know. I don't know, George. It's been a while. Um, yeah, how, okay. How, how to say that? So you talked. Uh, you opened the the um, sermon on Sunday by talking about the fact that we live in this uh, this fallen world, and a lot of people just walk through the world, not uh, not really experiencing the fallenness of it. I mean, we experience, you know, right. some minor difficulties and mm-hmm. um, you know some some. Some trial, trials, trying times. Uh-huh. Um, but there will come a, a point where the veil will be removed and we'll see right. just how fallen the world is. Right, yeah. You'll get hit. It'll feel like a like a truck hits you right in the face. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, somebody has, like, 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 there's a unexpected sudden death. Yeah. And, you know, people, they, they're so shocked by it. Initially, they're in denial about it, but... You know, if you're in the hospital and someone's laying there in intensive care, you're like, it just hits you. Mm-hmm. Like, if you have a Christian worldview anyway, like if you know the storyline, then you're like, the uh, the effects of the fall are v- far-reaching and vast. Um, and it usually takes something like that big to hit you to, because to, we don't we don't just walk around like with that on our mind. Right. You know, first responders are come face to face with all the time. So police and firemen, you know, they have to live with that. It's a heavy burden that they carry. Is that they maybe don't have the luxury of turning it off because mm-hmm. they encounter it every week, right? Like every single week. Uh, but it, but no matter what, I mean, everybody has to deal with it. Um, eventually, mm-hmm. could be a. Uh, um, a sickness like the doctor gives you, you know, he says, Hey, you got best you got is two years to live mm. out of, out of the blue. Yeah. Right. And then bam, you get hit with it. Right. A betrayal, like somebody, uh, maybe you're one of your best friends, mm. you know, you found out like, Hey, uh, he's actually not your best friend. Like he ran off with your wife. Mm. Like that stuff happens in this mm-hmm. world. You know what I mean? It's, right. And then that stuff just hits you. And, 
you know, once you once you see it though, then you kind of never unsee it. There's mm-hmm. like kind of a in America, our children, not all children, because some sometimes you know terrible things can happen, and, and a young person has to process stuff early early. But a, a lot of people in America, because of God's general grace and the relative safety and uh, med- access to medical care everyone has here, they can get all the way to adulthood without ever having come face to face with something really bad. Mm-hmm. Right. But eventually, eventually something happens and then you're just like, bam. Yeah. You're just you're hit with it. Right. So, uh, so drop us back into this book because um, this is a difficult book to mm-hmm. read. If, if you're just sitting down and reading it on your own, there's um, it's difficult to kind of see the outline um, and where we've been, where where we're going. Um, mm-hmm. So kind of help us. We're, we're in chapter 3, verse 16, mm-hmm. going through chapter 4, verse 6. Right. Um, so help us to get back into the book because it, it's been a it's been a while. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since we've been in it. So um, so help us get back into the book. All right. So Ecclesiastes this is wisdom literature. It's written by Solomon. Solomon is the the son of King David. He built the temple, um, and he had peace and prosperity on every side, uh, near infinite amount of resources and wealth. Um, and he reflects, most people believe, later on in life. He reflects back on his life and mistakes, and, I mean, he had a lot of mistakes. You can read about it in the Bible. And um, it's, I don't know, the, like how to describe it. It's like a masterwork on the human condition. So even if you don't have any religious background at all, like if you, like we say, hey, we have Judeo-Christian worldview. Well, we share a certain worldview in common with even those that would say they're Jews, though Christian and Judaism, very different. We still share this background of a creator who made the God who made the world very good, a fall. Um, there's one God, we're made in his image, and he has these kind of laws in place in the world to restrain evil, all this stuff. If you don't know any of that, you never even heard of Jesus or anything. You could pick this book up and read it, no matter where you're at on planet Earth, what culture you're in, right? Man or woman. Um, you could be from, you know, India, or you could be from California. You could pick the book up and read it, and it's written in such a manner where you could go, like, um, how does he understand what's going on in my mind? How does he understand the world in which I live? And this is written uh, a long time ago right, in the Middle East, but somehow he is written in such a way, I think somehow, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it has this all, it has this kind of a, um, evangelistic, there's an evangelistic flavor to it, but he comes at it in these strange, very, very strange and odd ways that we're not used to, right? So he'll kind of go with, uh, like, hey, how is the mind, how, how is the mind of a person who doesn't really have any interest in God, just lives their life as if he's not, he doesn't even exist, what are they going to encounter in their life, and like, how are they going to process things, and then how, when I, when Solomon writes about it, it has this way of like drawing you to the obvious conclusion, which is that you've got to look beyond yourself, mm. or your whole life will be utterly <clears throat> empty and meaningless. Yeah. So that's how he, he begins in chapter one. He says, a vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by the toil at which he toils under the sun? And that's kind of the main theme of the book. Vanity is a key word. It has a wide range of meanings, but the majority of the time it means something like fleeting or or empty or, you know, like the wind, mm-hmm. or your life is a vapor. Right. That's how James describes your life. Right. Um, that's what it means. It's like fleeting, empty, meaningless, a vapor. Um context kind of draws out those subtle distinctions. But what does a man gain for all his toil under the sun? That's what he's getting at. Like, if you're going to live and work in this world as if you can get gain, what can you gain from work if if all you have is this perspective as all li- all there is to life is this, what I can observe on this horizontal plane, 
and he says you can gain nothing, mm. right? And so the way he kind of gets to God, even even there go he'll go a long time without ever mentioning God, but he's kind of like always there, like he's in the background. Um, as you can you can try all this stuff, but you're going to end up really empty. Mm-hmm. So he got the first sermon. We kind of explored the main themes. Second sermon, he took he like said, like hey. I went on this quest, quest, this pleasure quest, uh, to see what could actually give me gain or make me full. He tried knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge and philosophy, it failed. He tried pleasure, so hedonism, and he went after everything. Um, alcohol, entertainment, sex, wealth, like everything that you could ever try. As I said before, he did the Charlie Sheen <laughs> before Charlie Sheen did the Charlie Sheen. Yeah. And he already had discovered where it ends, and it ends in totally empty meaninglessness. And the other phrase he uses often is, it's all a striving after the wind. You can't catch the wind, and that's what he does. So then in, in chapter uh, 3, he begins to um, kind of add a little sparkle, a little glimmer of... of uh, hope and theology, that time exists for a purpose. Like this is the famous passage that's always read at funerals. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under the sun, and he lists all of these. And time shows us two things. One, where we are more, we're just mere mortals. We can't determine the seasons. Like we didn't, we can't determine when we plant crops and when we're, you know, when we harvest. We didn't determine when we're born or when we die. We didn't determine that. Hey, if you laugh at funerals, like something's wrong with you. Like there, <laughs> there's appropriate things in the world. It's kind of like ingrained to the universe. Yeah. And so, who 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 made these things? Who made the seasons? Who made things appropriate for their time? And then he tells you, obviously, it's it's God. God <clears throat> is infinite, outside of time space, the appointer of all time, and the reason time functions is that so we should stand in awe of who God is, reverential awe of who He is. Mm-hmm. And then we jump into this, um, which is observations. He in- enters into a section where he makes repeated observations about the world okay. or life under the sun. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's have you read it. You um, you mentioned something about this passage that I wanted to ask you a little bit more, just out of personal curiosity. But I want you to read it first. Okay. Um, so we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 16 and going through chapter 4, verse 6. Mm-hmm. All right. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see that they are themselves but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to the one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of a man goes upward and the spirit of a beast goes down to the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Again I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are alive, but better than both is he who has not yet been born, and not a seen and and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw all the toil, that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and striving after the wind. All right. Um, you. Uh, so this is... Uh, you you structured this as three observations about the world east of Eden. Mm-hmm. You mentioned um, that some uh, commentators thought that this was maybe possible objections. Yeah. To uh, to chapter three, mm-hmm. I was curious about that. You didn't have time to to go into that, but uh, I was wondering a little bit about. Yeah. That. So some people will structure it around like five objections. So 
Okay. Um, I, I, if I try to remember what their five were, and then I'll tell you why I don't think that's the best way to outline it. Um, so objection, injustice, objection, uh, death, um, objection, oppression, objection. Number four is oh, objection, like envy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then number five, I believe, is where I'm going next week. Objection, um, like loneliness. Mm, okay. Or isolation. Okay. So there are things to say, oh, if God has appointed a time for everything under the sun, what about injustice, mm. death, oppression, envy, and loneliness? Okay. That's good, and I think those are common objections we see, but really the, the textual structure is... So kind of a, a theodicy, is that right. is that kind of what's going on? That, yeah, that's... What about that's evil and about. suffering? Uh-huh. Okay. But I think it's the clearest the clearest way to do it is to is to structure around these observations. Okay. So, moreover, I saw mm-hmm. that's an observation, mm-hmm. and then he, underneath that observation, there are clear ref- reflections. I said in my heart, right? That's how he's perceiving. Mm-hmm. And then another observation again, I saw all the oppressions, mm-hmm. and then another observation is then I saw. Okay. So that's how I did it. I yeah. did it based off of those. Okay. Because I think it follows better the structure. Okay. All right. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Okay. So um, we won't rehash the entire sermon. But I will but tell I, you this, as I said before, and I'll say again, <laughs> there are a million different yeah. outlines to the book. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's uh, it definitely is a difficult book. Yeah. Um. But I think you're doing a good job walking us through it, and I, I feel already that I understand it better than I did. Um, so we've got three observations, and the observations are really simple um, right. for us to, to see from the text. So we'll spend time on his reflections, mm-hmm. because you said that that this is meant to teach us how are we supposed to live in, right. this, in this fallen world. Mm-hmm. Right? How, what, are, what as believers are we supposed to do yeah. with this? And that it's... it's uh, we're, I, he spends a lot of time on the observations and then getting to like the one simple philosophy. Uh-huh. So the right the style of communicating is probably not the way we communicate today. Mm. We'd spend a lot more time on like, okay, now here's how we do this. Right. But he's like front loads all this other stuff, and then there's just a couple of verses on like practical advice. Yeah. You know. And I like what you uh, what you said is that we have the advantage of living after the cross. Mm -hmm. And so we have an advantage to reading this book that even Solomon didn't have in all of his observations. And I think that's, I think that's something that we need to be reminded of that um, we are living in the last days. Um, Christ has inaugurated the new covenant. Um, We see God's plan, how it's unfolded. Um, and I think that helps us as we go back to Ecclesiastes. We're not reading this as um, as Jews under Solomon. Mm-hmm. We're reading this as Christians now under Jesus. Right. Right. Yep. So that helps us to uh, to interpret this <clears throat> yeah. um, in the the way that, in which it ought to be interpreted. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So let's look at um, let's look at this first observation, which is that east of Eden, the world is full of injustice. And yeah. we see that right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, if you have your Bible in front of you, you can just read it. Moreover, moreover I saw under the sun that <clears throat> in the place of justice, even, there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even, there was wickedness. Yeah. So, so um, what is injustice? Um, injustice has more of a, a legal connotation, um, and... In the in this way, it means something that is contrary to God's law, right? And even if you take that one step further, it's things that are contrary to God's nature. And that's important. Okay, yeah. God's laws are not arbitrary. Right. They come out of uh, of Him, out of who He is. So He gives the Ten Commandments. He gives the other laws. He's not just like He's He's giving laws for human flourishing, but they're also a reflection of His character and nature. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, you can read all about injustice. I summarized it kind of in two two verses, one from Isaiah 5, one from Proverbs 17. It's to acquit the guilty. Acquit the guilty for a bribe and to 
then deprive the innocent of their rights mm. in justice. Yeah. To justify the wicked, uh, Proverbs seventeen fifteen. to justify the wicked and to condemn the righteous, both are an abomination to the Lord. Mm-hmm. So in justice, <clears throat> obviously we know the world is filled with wickedness, but right. the place where you would go and you would think, okay, well, th- the way this is supposed to work, if we go to court, right, that's supposed to be where the place of justice is. In the place of justice, even there was wickedness. The court is not supposed to be that way. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be fair right? and even, whether you're rich or even it, like if you're influential, just like the, the, the peasant. Mm-hmm. Like you're supposed to have equal standing in the justice system. Right. Um, in Solomon's day, it was supposed to be like that, and it's supposed to be like that in our day. Mm. And, you know, we have, as, as I said, everyone can see the imagery of it in our courts, the blindfolded lady, that's Lady Justia, mm. and uh, she's got scales in her hands, and they're supposed to not be biased scales. They're supposed to be even, and, and justice is blind. That's what she communicates. But it's not that way. Yeah. It's not that way in our courts, and uh, Solomon observes that even... In his day, um, justice is often, it is often perverted, and there's wickedness in our courts. I think that's that's really um, relevant for today. We're, we're always hearing about injustice, mm-hmm. right? There's injustice all around us. Um, so I think it's, it's important for us to, to recognize that um, the courts in Solomon's day were supposed to be governed by God's law. Mm-hmm. So God, God has given extensive commands for how the um, how cases should be tried, mm-hmm. and what uh, what the standard should be, what the punishment should be. So I think that it's it's really interesting that he would say, even in his day, that you look at the place where there's supposed to be justice and there's wickedness, mm-hmm. um, and that should I think put a little bit of perspective on our own day, um, where our laws, whereas originally they were based upon God's law, Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not really anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what should we expect? Right. Right. Um, so as Christians, we need to be looking at the world through the lens of the scriptures and we should have this perspective that look, even in Solomon's day, we see injustice uh-huh. and they're supposed to be ruled by God's law as written in the first five books of the Bible mm-hmm. um, and yet Solomon can make this this statement right um, so what should we expect to see in our in our own culture mm-hmm. right we're not going to see more <laughs> more right. justice right right yeah we're going to see more injustice because mm-hmm. as more and more of God's law is jettisoned right we're going to see more injustice mm-hmm Right. That's right. Um, so it again, this is to remove the veil from this fallen world. Right. Right. Um, people want to that they are pursuing justice. We we I mean we uh, we hear it all the time, mm-hmm. um, and we can we can instantly throw this into you know well they're just being woke. Right. Um, but no, there are there is real injustice, mm-hmm. uh, and the call that out isn't to be woke. Um, it's simply to pull back the veil and say, well, what do you expect? We live in a fallen world. Right. I like what you said about the uh, the um, the law professor. Yeah. About the the judicial system here in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember where I heard this, but uh, so it is. You know, guys in law school, and uh, it's like early on in the class, and the and the teacher's like, we have the best legal uh, legal system in the world. It's like the this is the most fair. The most just legal system, court system that's ever been on planet Earth. And then he said, and if, if people tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and as we know, because we believe what the Bible says about right. humanity, humanity, that if makes all the difference. It's a huge if. Right. And I told you before, it's like, it's like I've I've had conversations with my kids, like, who knows what could happen in their life? Mm-hmm. You always, always exercise your right to remain silent. Don't ever say a single thing, mm. ever, because you know what? Um, lawyers are fallen people, right? And uh, judges are fallen people, mm-hmm. and some people, some people will actually lie. Yeah, I mean, you can turn on. I mean, go watch. Uh, 
2020, you can watch people getting thrown in jail because lawyers are corrupt mm -hmm. and they know someone's innocent, but they don't care. They yeah. want to make a case and, yeah. you know, advance their career. And yeah. yeah, I think that's a good reminder of the depravity of man. We, I think we, um, we'll, we'll profess that we believe in total depravity, that it affects every aspect of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I, th I think we walk it back sometimes and we think, well, these people are doing this out of the kindness of their of their hearts. Like they've got altruistic mm -hmm. motives, and we forget that um, fallen mankind is capable of of practically anything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that that should remind us of of why there's injustice, right? And what we should expect. Um, maybe the the second half of that verse is a little bit more surprising. We right. go to the place where there's supposed to be justice, mm -hmm. and there's wickedness. But then he goes to the place where there's supposed to be righteousness, mm -hmm. and there's wickedness. Yeah. So um, this is like the uh, this is like the the religious sphere. Mm -hmm. So you have the legal sphere, the religious sphere. Um, this would be the place where you would think. Well, we would say in the church today, but in Solomon's day, in the in the temple, the priesthood, and all mm -hmm. of those people, you would think, okay, these people are going to follow God's law. These people will be just, right? And we know from the Old Testament stories, yeah, that's not the case, right? I mean, you, we often the problems of the rest of Israel originate with the priest, the priest. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, they're they're uh, corrupt. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't even know the Lord at all. Yeah, and uh, they pervert justice all the time. Right. And yeah. you can see both of the court and the religious world being unjust in Jesus' arrest mm -hmm. and his trial. Right. You have the scribes. Uh, and you have the uh, the priest and the high priest, right? They put on a farce trial. They don't even follow God's law in the trial. Right. They have false witnesses even to bear false witness against him. Mm -hmm. um, but then when they take him to the uh, to the Roman officials, who is the final court, you know he wields the right to execute. Uh, he doesn't even think Jesus is guilty. Yeah. But he's 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 really bribed. Yeah. So he's corrupted. Uh huh. Uh, and they demand that. Well, he's bla he's blackmailed. He's yeah yeah. He's blackmailed with pressure, like political uh -huh. pressure, because right. yeah. he doesn't want to be known as not a friend of Caesar. Uh -huh. And so he, he has an innocent man killed, mm -hmm. and they are yelling for it, release Barabbas, the murderer. Right. Take Jesus, like in the end, so you can see both yeah. happen there. Yeah, so the, the world is filled with, if this is what... If, I mean, Again, you got to remember this is this is Solomon. Go back to go back to First Kings and read the description of Israel under Solomon, um, the peace and the prosperity. And um, Solomon is is wise, and he's saying this: if this is the best that that the world has to offer, right? This this is probably the best time in human history mm. is living in Israel under King Solomon. Um, and yet he still can make these statements. What are we going to expect yeah, I read, in, I, in 21st century I, America? I read something about the prosperity of Israel. He said, they said not only was Solomon incredibly wealthy, but everyone in Israel got really wealthy yeah. because of Solomon's prosperity. It said that, that silver was considered as nothing because there was so much of it. Yeah. Um, so, so we have to remember the context. We have to remember what's going on here, mm -hmm. um, and it should. It, again, it puts it into into perspective for for mm -hmm. America. Um, we're not going to have it better off than than Israel under Solomon. Yep. So, what? How are we supposed to live in a world that's filled with injustice? He gives some reflections. Well, yeah. He, so he doesn't get to it yet, but he just he kind of says, okay, um, injustice is going on in the world. Um, so he processes it in this way. Okay, so like, God is just. I mean, you have to take it back to God's character in His nature as mm -hmm. a just God. <clears throat> and he makes this reflection. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and every work. So mm -hmm. that is, I guess, a way to apply like an understanding process that there there's coming a judgment, mm -hmm. like the the injustice that we see. There's a reckoning coming. Yeah, he kind of tied back to chapter three. There's a time for everything under the sun. There's coming a time for justice. Yeah, God's perfectly just. Uh, the rock, His work is perfect. This is Deuteronomy thirty-two. All His ways are justice. Um, and just and upright is He. Yeah, I've been reflecting a lot on uh, Psalm thirty-seven mm. lately, and it starts with "Fret not, 
over the evildoers um, because they're going to be gone. God's going to sweep them away, and the and the just or the meek will inherit the earth, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, it, and we see this all throughout the the um, the the uh, the Psalter, um, Psalm seventy three, mm-hmm. um, where Asaph is uh, contemplating life, yeah, and the prosperity of the wicked, mm-hmm. and he goes into the temple and he is reminded of what's going to happen, yeah, right? That God's going to judge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a time coming for judgment. I mean, you know, we think about it. If you if you've been personally wronged or had injustice committed against you, you may will think, well, they may just die, and they'll they're never. I'm never getting justice in this life. Mm-hmm. That may be so, but God's eternal. There's a day of reckoning coming. There's a day when everyone will stand before Him, and He will judge perfectly based mm-hmm. off of who He is, mm-hmm. and it will be perfect justice that right. that is done. Yeah. Like uh, Jeffrey Epstein d- is not getting away with what he did, right? Because he killed himself. Yeah. Um, or <laughs> or did he? Right? Or did he? So the people, the people, even who would want to silence him, yeah. they're not going to get away with it, right. either. Right. Yeah. So there's a day of reckoning coming for mm-hmm. everyone, mm-hmm. and, and I, John MacArthur reminded that to Governor Newsom in mm-hmm. that letter. I thought that was yeah. good. Yeah. That you're in great mortal danger. Your soul is in great danger. There's a day of reckoning coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and you can't stand before this God. Yeah. So that day's coming, um, and that and that's a comfort to the righteous, yeah. as well as a warning to the wicked, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, that every injustice is going to be um, made right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so then, so God is just. There there is coming judgment. Yeah, and then he reflects in eighteen through twenty one. It's kind of this reflection about uh, death, but. And so I think it's more in line of, okay, uh, there's delayed justice. Mm-hmm. There is a day coming, right? but what's going on now? Mm-hmm. Like, God's justice is delayed. Mm-hmm. So he says... Um, and I think he's going to say that later in Ecclesiastes, if mm-hmm. I remember. Yeah, these themes will repeat. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So I, I had even considered doing an entire sermon about death, but as I went back through... I was like, oh, well, I got that's coming, so I'm gonna hold off now. <laughs> All right, so we'll be looking forward to that uplifting Christmas right. message from right. Ecclesiastes. <laughs> yeah, on death. Yeah, the whole thing's on death. <laughs> um, yeah, so he he now he begins to reflect on this. Like, what's going on? I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them. So there's some type of test going on that they may see that they are themselves but beasts. And then he goes into this uh, further reflection, like man dies just like a beast. Yeah. As one dies, so dies the other. They have the same breath in them. That's God's breath, of, the breath of life. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're gonna. We all die just like beast. All is vanity. That's temporary or fleeting mm-hmm. in that sense. Yeah. Um, your life is but a vapor, mm-hmm. just like an animal's. And we all go to the same place. We all return to the dust. And then, who knows whether the spirit of man, you know, goes upward or the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth? Who knows? So he starts to say these things that. To us, seem strange. We're mm-hmm. like, well, can he? What is he talking about? Yeah. Like, doesn't he know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, well, I guess we can work through these. They're kind of th- they're, I think, three kind of takeaways from <clears throat> this. Mm-hmm. It, one is that it seems clear. The way he kind of gets at it isn't like the w- way we would just say it, but justice is delayed because God is allowing man's wickedness to increase on the earth so that they can see how evil and wicked they are that they're like more like they're more wicked than an animal mm-hmm. they're they're a beast yeah like man has become a beast who yeah ravages themselves and does terrible things and doesn't under and perverts justice and right um, yeah you uh I mean <laughs> I've used this with my children before <laughs> that, you know, the dog, the dog does what the dog is supposed to do. Mm-hmm. It does dog things. Right. But we, as, as sinners, we do things contrary to nature, yeah, uh, which makes us worse than an animal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, in Proverbs chapter 30. Um, he, he says, uh, surely I'm too stupid to be a man. <laughs> uh, because he does it without God's word, we are worse than animals, 
Right. Um, we can look at the animal world and we can see them doing animal things, uh-huh. even even you know violent things. Mm-hmm. But that's what they're that's what they do. That's what the animals do. Um, whereas humans who are made in God's image do things that are contrary to what we're supposed to be. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there, there's, there's kind of echoes of the garden all throughout this mm-hmm. and the fall in the yeah. garden. And they just pop up in various ways. And I think this is one of those ways. God's trying to remind us we're just beasts. Mm-hmm. Well, in the garden, what was promised that we would become like God. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> And we may have become like God in, in the one sense that God says is that, okay, now we we know good and evil. Yeah. But what do we do with that knowledge? <laughs> right. Well, we pervert it, yeah. suppress it, corrupt it, invent various, you know, we're creative in the way that we do evil. Yeah. And even when you look at Genesis uh, 1, 2, and 3, you see a reversal mm-hmm. that man is supposed to be um, ruler, uh, with his wife coming as helper. Um, and then uh, they have authority over the beast. And then in chapter three, you see it reversed with the beast has gained mastery first over the woman. Yep. And then she has mastery over her husband. Mm -hmm. It's all flipped. Yep. Yep. And so, uh, we, we didn't, we're not really gods, mm. and God's reminding us of that. He right. says, like, okay, uh, justice will be delayed. Play mm. play God. Yeah. And look at you. Yeah. You're worse than an animal. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's like we get it when there's, like, horrible atrocities done, and we think this is in, inhumane. Mm. We have a word for it, and then we forget about it again. Yeah. It's meant to, like, break us mm. and humble us before God. Yeah. Um. Uh, help us help us with uh with verses um 19 through 21 okay uh, what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same as one dies so dies the other they all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beast for all his vanity help right. help help us to understand what solomon is doing because we don't just have ecclesiastes we have the entirety of the mm-hmm. Old Testament. They, they had Genesis. They, they knew that man was made in God's image. Mm-hmm. Um, they had, you know, Psalm eight, that man has been given authority over the animals. Mm-hmm. So what, what is Solomon doing here? Because obviously, man is not just another animal. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what is he? What, what kind of uh, rhetorical device is he using here? He's he's trying to get people to understand their mortality. Right? Mm. We don't we don't live with uh, we live we live as if we're immortal. We put death out of our mind, mm. like a young person. This when you're younger, you definitely don't think about it. You think you're bulletproof and you can never die. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe as you get a little older, toward midlife, maybe you like every once in a while you start to think about like oh. I'm going to die. And he just says outright, like, um, you go to the same place. Like, you're going to die. The mm-hmm. fall the fall happened. You're cursed. You're returning to the dust. He's reminding them of the curse. Mm-hmm. At Genesis 3, when you go back there, that's what the last thing God says to Adam. You're from the dust, and to the dust you're going to return. Yeah. And that's why probably in your Bible this section might even be called from dust to dust in some Bibles. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're you're mortal. Um, you're not like God. You're gonna die. Um, and so that's meant to remind us again. I, I think it, and to and to humble us. But he's also he takes up this idea of like if you again he as I said often he'll dip into this mind view the mind of like a secular person. Okay. So if you're a secular person and you begin to look at the world. Make an observation. What happens to you happens to an animal. You just die. Mm. The animal dies. You die too. Yeah. Um, and that reveals this further element of ignorance that you don't. Not only <clears throat> do you see that you don't know what happens mm. when you die. But Jay, we're just all stardust. <laughs> right. Doesn't that, doesn't that doesn't that inspire awe? I know. In yeah, your, yeah. In you. Yeah, we're all stardust. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but nobody wants to be uh, just dust. Right? Yeah. There's eternity has been put into the heart of man, which mm-hmm. we already saw yeah. in chapter three. Yeah. Um, but God's showing us our ignorance. Not only is He showing us our m- that we're just mortals, we're going to die like the animals die. Mm. Uh, God's showing us our ignorance. Who knows whether the spirit of a man goes upward, spirit of the beast goes down to the earth. Who knows? Like nobody, you don't know that. Nobody knows that, right? If it, if you're just going to live in the the secular way mm-hmm. with little little to no regard for God and pursue pleasure in the world, make your observations then. Yeah. What happens? What happens when a man dies? Right. Well that that cow just died, right? <laughs> that guy just died. Yeah. We're gonna bury him. Mm-hmm. Um and then you have all various speculations. Right. Right. You have all these different views of it, religions. Yeah. You know, of what happens after somebody right. dies. So uh so don't don't formulate your uh, your theology from these statements, right? Yeah, in, in Ecclesiastes. Yeah, I mean, um, he's asking these questions, but he's not. Well, he knows the answer. He knows the answer because right? he he'll state the answer explicitly mm-hmm. at toward the end of the book. Right. He'll just he'll tell you exactly what happens when uh-huh. you die. Your spirit returns to God. Right. Yeah. And you know, then there's the judgment. Right. Uh-huh. right. Your spirit returns to God, so He knows that. So these questions they're functioning in like in this rhetorical fashion, right. and they can be coupled with the other question. Yeah, seven, seventeen, and twenty and twenty-one would be directly contradictory if if uh, we were just putting a theology together, right? Right, mm-hmm. um, because he he's already said that God's going to judge. Yes, right. And he asks another question: Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Mm. And twenty-two. So you put that one together with uh, with this question here. Uh, on 21, who knows where the spirit man goes upward? And the answer is from the secular worldview. They don't know. Mm-hmm. No, Nobody can tell me what happens after. <laughs> and what happens, I, it's just speculation. Mm-hmm. But the obvious one that's staring you in the face is the one who appoints all the time from chapter 3. He knows, and he can tell you. Yeah. Right. So God can tell you. God knows. So... Death is meant to uh, to take us to this place of humility, where we would look beyond to God yeah. uh, for our answers to these questions. Okay. And the language I said is real similar to Psalm ninety, for, Psalm forty nine, mm. thirteen through fifteen. And there are two men in that too. There's the really uh, proud and arrogant man, um, and his he's like a sheep appointed for Sheol, and death is his shepherd. Mm. Right? It is very vivid language, but the humble person, God will ransom my soul from Sheol. Mm. So there's a difference there. Okay. And so that's the first observation. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the second observation is found in chapter four, which mm-hmm. is that east of Eden, the world is full of oppression. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talked about injustice in verse 16. Now we're talking about oppression. Okay. What? Uh, let's define oppression and maybe distinguish it from injustice. All right. So injustice, obviously, it would be a perversion of God's law, mm-hmm. and it has this a more of a legal context uh, to it, as we saw, the courts, the church. Uh, but oppression is like the act of stealing or depriving from another human being what's theirs by God's grace. Okay. Right. Um, and that's what the laws of God actually are protecting. Uh, the first table of the law has to do with God, mm-hmm. and we are not to rob God. Mm-hmm. Right? God is due all glory, honor, and worship. But then the other half have to do with man, and they have to do with us of oppressing or robbing each other of what is ours by divine right. I, I don't know how to say it. Like uh, right. uh, that, God has there are we're s- made in God's image. Right. When you are born a human being. God has granted you rights yeah. that are not to be violated. We have um, certain inalienable rights. That's how the founding fathers put it. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So, and if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're structured in in that way to where those uh, those could be protected. Your right to life. That's why murdering is is wrong because you have a right to your own life. No one has a. It should be able to take that away, um, and so you have a right to self defense. You have a right to your own property, so don't steal. God says don't steal. You have a right to your reputation, so lying and bearing false witness is wrong. 
um, and you have a right to marry and to have children. Mm -hmm. So you can't covet another person's wife or another person's husband, right? Mm -hmm. You have a right to, because marriage is so foundational for human society, a man and a woman, and you have that right. Now, that doesn't mean you have to Mm -hmm. or you're sinning, but you have that right to your to your spouse and and your children then have a right to parents mm-hmm. male and female parents yeah and to deprive to to deprive a child and we could say even today in in the context of a divorce if you deprive a child of that right to grow up with a mother and father father that's oppression mm. okay so there's uh he sees all the oppressions that are done under the sun. They're various and vast. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. Yeah. And that's... That's how it works. That's always, how it works. Right? From right. the lunchroom bully, mm-hmm. you know, who uh, twists a kid's ear and steals his, uh, mm. his lunch that his mom made him and then kicks him off the stool. Uh-huh. Uh, he's being oppressed. Right. Um, and who's gonna who's who's gonna help that kid? Mm-hmm. Usually, everybody stands back like a bunch of cowards, <laughs> right. you know. And the kid starts crying, and I mean, but then that's small, and you but mm-hmm. you just yeah, take that yeah, yeah. up and extrapolate it. The whole world is filled with this, right? Okay, so we talked we we hit on this a little bit with the injustice, but you you brought it out in in this uh, this observation that Solomon's the king, right? Um, if anyone can solve the problem of injustice or oppression, it should be him. Right. right. So why didn't he just put down all oppression? So I I, I probably should have made it more clear. Uh, I could have used the, the the little game at Chuck E. Cheese where there's like a little groundhog pops the, up the and whack smack him in the head. Uh-huh. I'm sure he actually did deal with injustice and oppression. I don't uh-huh. think he just sat back and was like, hey, whatever you guys want to do. Right. Roll with it. <laughs> right. Um, but when you you, whack- wouldn't, you wouldn't have the description... Of his kingdom in in First Kings right. that we have, right? If he was just whatever, yeah. So, so first thing to I should have made it more explicit too is he's not the ruler of the earth, right? <laughs> right. He, he can even observe other nations, uh-huh. yeah, and other the way their governments function and the way their people function, yeah. But even in his own, I mean, he could smack some oppression down like the groundhog, and right. then what happens? Oh, it pops up over here. So I spend my entire life just smashing out oppression everywhere. Well, I thought I think that your your illustration of the lunchroom bully is also a good example because there are there are uh, uh, multiple f- uh, ways in which we can oppress or be oppressed that aren't against the law. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Like not all oppression is. Um, illegal. Sure. Divorce is perfectly legal in the United States. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that doesn't mean it's not oppressive. Right. Um, there's a, there are, there's various, various things. Mm-hmm. Um, you could put, you could theoretically not violate God's law, I suppose, and uh, skirt around your responsibilities to uh, not acquire more than you needed, uh, like of your, like I say, of another family's land. And next thing you know, they're without any land. And if they followed the Jubilee, and they were, fr- they could be freed from that. But as we know, they, they often didn't even follow that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, the, the story uh, where Boaz, his fields are able to be... Uh, the, the sojourner is able to come in and to pluck from his fields because he's following God's law. That's rare. Like mm-hmm. he's mentioned because what he's doing in the time of a, a when a drought just ended is incredibly rare. Mm-hmm. So people would follow God's law, but you know maybe for show we've got one where we leave the but the rest of my land I'm just I'm just harvesting all of it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. There's just various ways, right. and he can't he can't end. He can't end all oppression, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, I think about our our own government, and our, our government is, you know, trying to free the world of all of, right. of, of, of you know all oppression. That's why you know they want to move to electric vehicles uh, because um, 
you know, fossil fuels, it's uh, contributing to global warming and global warming. They even say it's like a that's like a racism right. issue. Um, and uh, you get rid of fossil fuels to end that oppression. But then you have electric vehicles and where's the materials coming from to right. make yeah. those. Uh, you've got, you know child slaves yeah, <laughs> you know, child, yeah. chi child laborers that are digging, digging up, up the the materials mm -hmm. to make these batteries so you end one oppression but another one pops up yep um you know you've got biden that just uh released his you know his plan to end world hunger mm -hmm. what in 20 by 2035 or something like that I don't know. How's he, how's he going to do that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's right. he's going to, you know, he's he's trying to end this this oppression. We're all going to eat cockroaches. I guess so. I guess so. Which is uh, oppressive, right? It's you know, it's just another it's just another form of mm -hmm. of oppression. So it is. It's like that game of whack a mole. You you put down one form of oppression, and it pops up somewhere else. Slavery is right. a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. We're obsessed in America with. You know, our in America, our uh, complicity in slavery, uh -huh. which you know, for for the most part, was between fifteen twenty five and eighteen sixty six, an atrocity for sure. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Twelve point five million Africans, and only ten point seven actually made it over here, which yeah. is crazy to think about. But yeah. uh, obviously, an evil, a great evil. That, um, but who who went about putting out that oppression? It, shocker! It was Christians that did that. Mm. People like like to ignore that part of history, yeah. and that England even had um, even England addressed it without a war. We had a war over here, God's judgment on us. But which was another form of which was another form of oppression. Right? Tons of people died, yeah. and we're still dealing with mm. it today. Yeah, uh, but we didn't invent slavery. <laughs> right. right. What? <laughs> like say, next yeah, right. year, next you're going to tell me that yeah. white people didn't invent slavery. Yeah, white. Jay. <laughs> White people didn't invent slavery. Who knows who invented slavery? Yeah. But, I mean, Israelites were enslaved uh -huh. in Egypt. Right. Um, Weren't all the Egyptians white people? Uh, There's just a bunch of white men. Yeah. That were. And, uh, yeah, so in, in, in today, yeah. even today, like, we ended this, this slavery. Right. Uh, but even today, there's slavery in other parts of the world. Yeah. And yeah. then today, illegally... You there's have, still, there's there's still, still slavery. There's still slavery here in America. Yeah, you have, se you have uh, sex slaves. Right. Human trafficking, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, uh, no, I'm not saying you throw up your hands and you quit. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. You get you, you address one oppression. Yes, another man, one's man creates up. another one. Right, and that's kind of the point, right? Like we we live in a fallen world that you, you even said that oppression is so ingrained in the world that you can't stamp it out. Mm -hmm. Again, that's that's not to say we don't do anything against this kind of oppression but it does um it does if we're living in the world under the sun there is futility to it there is the sense of there's what can we do we we can never get rid of all oppression right yeah um so there is that vanity mm -hmm. if we if we're just living in this fallen world under the sun, and we try, you know, we think that we can accomplish this, uh, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the president's plan is to end world hunger, it's going to end up being vanity. Mm -hmm. um, because as soon as you solve or, you know, think that you've solved some problem, something else is going to pop up. Mm hmm. Uh, because of this fallen world, and then we get uh, we get these difficult verses in right, verses yeah. two and three, yeah, yeah. Uh, that we've got to talk about okay. because what what are we supposed to do with this? And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. It sounds like Solomon is saying, "Why don't you just go kill yourself?" Jay, yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what it sounds like. Yeah. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. We talked about this, I don't even know, six months ago, these people that um, say that we shouldn't have any children, mm -hmm. right? You remember talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems like you could look at 
versus two and three, and you could say, right. well, why? Well, they have. Why I think they even we? had that in some yeah, of the I, proof I, I, Probably. Why? Why should we have? Why should we bring children into this fallen world? It's mm-hmm. better that they never are even born than to experience a world that's filled with oppression. Right. So, what do we do with verses two and three? How, how do we not? How do we not just become nihilists and say, mm-hmm. well, why? Why don't we all just commit suicide? And then we don't have to live in this oppressive world anymore. We can catch the comet. That's right. <laughs> catch that comet yeah. like uh, that one cult. Yeah. Get us out of here. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I think one observation to make, and I didn't mention it, is we think that we're living in the worst time in human history. Mm. Um, maybe things have always been really bad. <laughs> right. We just have more modern technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then, so now we can record it and stuff. And right, right. But maybe things have always been really bad mm. east of Eden. Yeah. Maybe this place is a wasteland. Uh-huh. And that's meant to make us look elsewhere for help. Right. So, so that's yeah. one observation. You, but you think you think that the you think that the Middle Ages maybe were worse than than nowadays. I mean <laughs> the dark have, the dark ages when when uh everyone was illiterate and no hospitals and no education and ruled by kings kings and popes when you're talking about yeah like access to <laughs> and health they ha- and they things. had you know they had the they had the the plague and right yeah <laughs> yeah we have actually uh, we ha- have better technology we have better health care uh, we do generally better we live longer mm. but people have felt like this forever right, right. right? it'd be better if i wasn't ever born mm. like that that's not something people just started saying today <laughs> right you know solomon he says it so you read this right and you go Hmm, like uh <laughs> yeah what these are these this? are not these are not the verses that your your grandmother is uh you know sewing into a doily right? <laughs> right. yeah yeah <laughs> that you can't you're not going to walk into the salt cellar and mm-hmm. find this on like a, a refrigerator magnet yeah or with a, a thomas kincaid painting and, mm-hmm. and this is the verse that's <laughs> that's put on there right right yeah um hopefully i first i'll ask you uh, what did you think about the way I explained it in the sermon? I, I thought it was really helpful. Okay. I thought because, it was helpful. as I said in the sermon, this is one of those things where I like got all my commentaries out, and I'm yeah. like, huh, uh, nobody's commenting on this part. <laughs> Thanks for your help. And, you know, John Calvin uh, didn't even have yeah. a commentary <laughs> that's right. on the entire book. Yeah. So... Well, they probably they probably looked at the book of Ecclesiastes and said, ah, I'm out. <laughs> Times, yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I'm like, okay, so I just sat there and you know, I pray. You, you, uh-huh. you, you, if you don't pray for insight, then right. you're just stupid for for trying to be a pastor. So I'd sit there, which is difficult for me because I'm a doer, right? For mm. me to sit still is difficult. Yeah. So I just sit still. I'm like, all right, think about, draw from what you've read before about the problem of evil and suffering, the way the Bible talks about that, and and so I just see like, okay, this 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 is really functioning more like a lament. Mm-hmm. So we don't read it. Number one, don't read this as a statement on reality. Right. Like, God's not telling you the truth of, hey, the way reality is, is that it would be better if you were never born. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Don't do that. Yeah. That's not what God's doing. I, I, yeah. I, it's, I, again, I think we should, we should emphasize the fact that um, we are not making a systematic theology out of these statements in Ecclesiastes because of what he's doing. Mm-hmm. His whole point is to show the vanity of life under the sun mm-hmm. apart from God. Right. Um, and... I think that's what he's doing here. Right, it's, it's the vanity of of living under the sun. He, he even says it uh, in in verse one that he looks at the oppression that's done under the sun. Yeah. Um, and what does it look like if this is all there is? Mm-hmm. If if the logical conclusion of atheism is just kill yourself, right? Why not? Mm-hmm. Uh, get out of here. Right. <laughs> why why do you why do you go to the doctor to try to prolong your life when it's just filled with misery and right. suffering and we're all just stardust anyway? Mm-hmm. Um that I think that's what's going on. So we don't come to this and say, well, this is um this is the Christian evaluation mm-hmm. of the world. Right. Right? right. Um and I don't even know that it is like an evaluation. I think it's more of um, the oppression is so great everywhere. The suffering is so bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lament. He's lamenting. Um, 
So he makes the comment. Um, so I think that's how you read it. You should read it as the truth of how awful the world is. Mm. How terrible and awful the world is that people, uh, men and women, could get to the point where they could say something like, I wish I was never born. Yeah. Like 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 someone ha- <clears throat> is just suffering with terrible, terrible cancer, and uh, the pain is so bad, they might say something like this. Mm. Or yeah. they might say, I wish I was dead. Yeah. So read this as as not as telling you this is how reality is, but that that the world is so bad that people can lament in this fashion, mm-hmm. that they'll say things like this. Yeah. So I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's sinful. Like if somebody suffering and pain is that bad, because the thing we forget a lot of times is that the fall has psychological consequences, mm-hmm. right. and and I don't mean like. In in like the psychotherapy thing, I mean like in your mind. Yeah, we live in a fallen world. When we talk about total depravity, we're not talking about man is as bad as he could be. We're talking about the fact that the fall has affected every single aspect of who we are. Yeah. So you you can break your arm. Mm-hmm. So if you ha- if you experience an incredible type of suffering that is traumatic, like your mind can break. Right. And you could say something out of, out of a lament, like mm-hmm. "I wish I was, I wish I was dead." Yeah. Um, so the two examples that I gave, because I don't think I don't think it's a sin to articulate something like that in a time of great distress. And I'm not saying that you do this because you know somebody cuts you off on the highway, <laughs> and you're like, "I wish I was dead right now." I'm hitting you know? all the red lights. I wish I was never born. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I gave two examples um, from the Bible. <laughs> yeah, Elijah uh-huh. and Job. Right. And Elijah actually asked God to kill him. Right. So yeah. he says, mm-hmm. I wish I was dead. Yeah. Could you just get it over with for me? <laughs> right. He feels like a massive failure, that he's totally failed God. Mm-hmm. Um, well, after he had a n- tremendous victory, like <laughs> right. it, it's the craziest thing. It's the craziest swing. It's like the most drastic swing. Well, I, th- I think I think what was going on in that story is you have the you have this massive victory where fire from heaven falls and all the people are are like Yahweh is God and they kill all the prophets of Baal. Mm-hmm. And I think Elijah was expecting this is revival. Mm-hmm. Um, that everything's going to be okay. Right. Instead. Jezebel sends him a note saying, "You're a dead man. Yeah, I'm gonna kill you." Mm-hmm. And he runs off because he's like, "What? What was it even for?" Right. Um, it's a momentary victory, and nothing has changed. Yeah. Um, what? <laughs> what else? Can, what else can happen? What? What needs to happen for there to be actual revival? If if fire from heaven <laughs> doesn't change the people's hearts, then what am I even doing? And God and God doesn't kill him. No. And no. God doesn't even go. Could be in weak. <laughs> like what's wrong with you? What's what's wrong with you? You see yeah. what what I just did? You saw it with your own eyes. Mm. Quit being a baby. Yeah. No, like God's kind and, and ministers. He ministers to him. Yeah. It gives him some some really really dope food. It gives him some food. The that food he can is go so for good. Forty days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a it's an interesting story. Then of course you have Job. Uh-huh. The first words out of Job's mouth when he speaks um, in chapter three is that he wishes he was never born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know he's sitting there on the ash, and he's got this worthless wife and uh, and these friends that are no help at all, just make things worse. And and he says he wishes he was never born. Yeah, and they're not alone. Jeremiah does it. Mm. I I didn't double check. I think Jeremiah maybe does it a couple of times in the book of Jeremiah. Yeah, um, because of how terrible it is in Jerusalem, and he. All he ever does whenever he opens his mouth is declare destruction, and yeah. the people just laugh at him. And here comes that crazy chair. I mean, it, it's like the guy with the, you know, the, the big the end is nigh. Card, cardboard sign. Yeah. That, that's what people looked at Jeremiah's. Uh, we, could see a, uh, we could see a foolish and, and I think, sinful uh, way of someone doing this mm-hmm. with Jonah. Right. Yeah. Jonah goes and preaches. <laughs> And right. he goes and he sits to see what's going to happen. Yeah. And God causes the, uh, the, the, plant. the plant to come up and shades them from the heat. And then God brings the worm that eats it and uh, it withers and the wind blows. And he's angry. Jonah says, I'm angry. And God says, oh, 
do you do well to be angry? He says, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die <laughs> right. uh, because because of this. Uh, so there is a sinful, right. there's, there, it can be sinful. But I think the way you presented it was um, maybe a comfort to people because we do live in a fallen world where we do experience things like oppression. And sometimes it can be so bad that you do wish that you would die. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that, like you said, I don't think that that's necessarily sinful. Right. I think our response, you know, if we if we continue in that, it's sinful. Right. Um, yeah. I think but, I think I think people that uh, whose hope is in God, they might momentarily like uh, be so traumatized by something that they're not they're not thinking about a, yeah. fu- a future that Christ has redeemed them and that, and that he's coming again and that he'll raise them from the dead and they'll be in glory with him and this is all worth it they just articulate you know i think that d- a deep lamentation but they'll they move beyond that yeah the one thing you don't see them doing is actually committing suicide right right the that um that level of hopelessness mm-hmm. um but uh, I, I think it's encouraging for us to remember. Like, we do live in a fallen world, and we are affected in more more than just you know physical way. Yeah, our our mind is affected. Our our emotions are affected, and it's okay to lament. Yeah, and, and to it, weep over this stuff. Yeah, uh, I think it, uh, you didn't bring this out, but I think it's also um, you know verses two and three. I, I think it also reveals God's grace mm-hmm. that we. We don't always experience this. Like the right. very fact that we have some good days and not all bad days is because God is gracious mm-hmm. and good to us, even in a fallen world where we don't live in, um, you know, a perpetual hell. Um, right. God, God does give us things to smile about. Mm-hmm. He does give us sunny days. Right. Um, and I, I think that those are things that we can be grateful for. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and it's a and it's a something that should be like a motivation because we have hope and we have hope in Christ that we can and we can go beyond that, mm-hmm. right? But there are people that don't. Yeah, they don't know about they don't know what Christ has done. Mm-hmm. They don't know how God has entered into this world of suffering and pain, like not theoretically mm-hmm. but actually yeah. in human flesh, and that He can identify with us in our weakness. He's known as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He's suffered tremendously in every way that we ever could, um, and beyond that, and experienced the wrath of God so that he could redeem us from a, this fallen world. People need to know that right. so that they can have hope mm-hmm. uh, and move out of their, you know, the place of despair that they're in. Yeah. So... All right, so uh, East of Eden, the world is full of injustice, full of oppression, now, verses four through six, it's full of envy. Yeah. So um, this is the third observation he makes, and he sees that all toil and skill and work come from one man's envy of his neighbor. Mm. So what he's saying is, look, uh, everybody, everybody works, right? Everybody is advancing in the world through work. Through um, skill and work is like progress in technology. You know what I mean? Skill and work. So what's driving the world? Like, what's the engine? What's the engine that's driving everything? Uh, and that's envy. Hmm. So um, people want more. They want either want more money, more lands, more food. Uh, they want, they look at their neighbor's stuff, and it could be even intangible things. Like, I, I want to be influential like that person. I want to I wanna be charismatic <clears throat> like they are. I, I want to, you know, I, I want what they have. And so people then go to school to acquire those intangible things, those skills. Um, they commit themselves to work, and they labor. But it's not just on an individual level. I mean, this is at this is the history of the world and why there's wars everywhere. That nations do this to other nations. They want their land. They want their resources. Uh, they want their water supply. I mean, you name it, right? Yeah. Um, and there's wars and nations raging against nations. Mm. Um, and envy drives the whole thing, and it it's a big black hole in your heart. It's a striving after the wind. Yeah. You, they'll they'll envy's never satisfied. Mm. You can never satisfy it. So if you covet your neighbor's stuff and you get it, well then you're going to covet 
somebody else's stuff. Right. And you're going to want that too. Yeah. So this is what drives drives the world. And there's the reason there's injustices and oppression is because um, the big gigantic wheel uh, of, of history and humanity is driven by envy. Mm. And it'll run over anyone and do anything. Yeah. So... Mm. Uh, so, uh, how should we work in a world that's driven by envy? And this is kind of the, the underlying, I think, kind of main idea and theme. He gets at it, though, by talking about all the the terrible stuff that's in the world. Uh But, uh, then he gets to, um, well, we skipped over, uh, 22, which we'll come back to. Mm -hmm. He kind of gives two ways that people work in the world that, that are here, there are those that live for their jobs. There are lazy people. So lazy people first. Um, the fool who folds his hands eats his own flesh. That's mm-hmm. a lazy person, mm-hmm. right? They uh, All throughout Proverbs, we see the person described like that, someone who folds their hands to mm-hmm. like take a little rest, yeah. you know? Um, and then destruction comes upon them suddenly. Well, here they cannibalize themselves because they don't have any money. They don't have any food. Right. Um, so this person's like, okay, the world is crazy, and uh, I'm just going to check out. I'm not going to be involved in this at all. Yeah. I'll be a moocher or whatever. Um, that's obviously not an option for Christians. And the other one he describes are two handfuls. Uh, it's slavery to work, two handfuls of toil. Mm. It's a striving after the wind. So it's getting all you can. So if you plunge your hand into a big bag of gold coins, you're going to pull out as much as you can, pull it up on your chest, and um, you're going to get all you can. That's the picture of someone who lives to work and lives to gain wealth, and it's uh, it's striving after the wind. Mm. It's it's empty and meaningless. They can never have enough. The third option there is uh, the one handful of quietness. That's the, that's the goal. How do you live in this fallen world? With one handful of quietness. And it took a lot of text to get there. <laughs> so the point is to be content, uh-huh. to live in this world content. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have a proper perspective, which we already were, are able to draw from, from what he's talking about in chapters, chapter 3. Uh, but if you go back to th- uh, 322, he talks about it too. I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. And what is a man's lot? Well, that's what God has given them. God has given you, like you are where you're at, you're in, you're doing the work, the toil that you are because God gave it to you. So what do you have to do in a fallen world, messed up crazy world? You live right now in the present moment, enjoying your work as a gift from God. Mm. And that's a simple, easy philosophy. But he talked about it in 312 uh, through 13, where he was talking about uh, the sovereignty of God and God appointing all the times, he says this, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. So it's a simple philosophy. Um, Understand that God has given you what you have. Enjoy it. Um, Enjoy your work as a gift from God and be content and just live live in the present live in the present moment working and finding joy and pleasure in knowing that God has given this to you um it's pretty simple philosophy really yeah you know right um but it's repeated all throughout the new testament contentment being mm-hmm. content uh timothy paul i mean it's it's everywhere. Right. Jesus talks about it. He talks about wealth and being content and not being anxious and all kinds of things. Yeah. So. Yeah, and really the only way you can do that is you believe in the providence of God. Yes. You have to believe that God um, has ordained when you would live, where you would live, the circumstances of your life, um, and all of the events that transpire that's the only way that you can be content mm-hmm. is by trusting in all of these things. So you have to have a high view of God's sovereignty in order to to really live a life of contentment. Yes, that's right. Yep. So um, 
and that helps you to uh, that helps you to um, take comfort from things in the past, mm-hmm. and also to be encouraged for things in the future. Right. Yeah. Um, this uh, this kind of idea is not possible. Like if you're if you're not living in the present moment, I think this is uh, you know it it's very practical, and you can kind of extrapolate that like hey. Like Jesus gives gives you some uh, some warnings through a command. Like you're not to be anxious mm. about tomorrow. Like there are people that only live for tomorrow. Right. They're stuck in what's going to happen in the future mm. and not knowing what's going to happen. And a billion it leads to a lot of anxiety. Oh, yeah. And like 99 percent of the things people worry about never happen. <laughs> yeah. And the other like one percent, they couldn't do anything about it anyway. Mm. Like, right. You ever heard that? Mm. Um, so what's the point? Like, and that's kind of what Jesus says. He's like, "Hey, today's got enough trouble of its own. Like, mm-hmm. what's right in front of you today? Right. For you to do, do yeah, do that, yeah. And then when tomorrow gets here, because tomorrow, the, yeah, live in the present, live in that day. <laughs> but, but tomorrow doesn't even exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist right now. Right. And you shouldn't even presume that it will. Right. Mm. Don't 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 love your parent. Or don't love your kids. Right. Tomorrow." You might die on the way home from work. Mm. So today, like if you have an opportunity to, to, to be a good father or mother to your kids, then do it. Mm. Do the same thing to your spouse. Yeah. Uh, and also be quick to forgive. Um, not just because, you know, tomorrow might not ever get here, but you can't you can't do this. You can't enjoy what God's given you today if you're stuck in the past. Mm. You can't do anything about it. It's gone. It doesn't exist. The past does not exist anymore. Right. The past doesn't exist, neither does the future. So if you're not forgiving, if you're not a forgiving person, you're just stuck in the past. Mm. You just live back there. Yeah. Um, but we aren't to live that way. So um, what do we have? We have what God's given us. He's What has he given us? He's given us work for pleasure. We don't think about work for pleasure, though. Right. Because we think work is something that happens post-fall. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not. Work is actually a little element of what was in the garden that God's preserved for us, because it gives us dignity, I think, and, and and we're created workers, so he's preserved that for his people, that we can still work for God and enjoy it. Right. Took a long time to get there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. So we, uh, we talked about this a little bit um, months ago. Um, because we were talking about this passage, mm. you've got Solomon, who is uh, the king of Israel. He knows the promises that God has given to his father David. Yep, one of your sons is going to build a temple, and he's going to sit on the throne forever. Mm-hmm. Right, so he's he's he is at least. <laughs> initially that guy right right i right. mean he's built the temple yeah. um god has given him peace on peace all sides on, he's given him side, prosperity yeah. um and then he looks around and he sees that there's still injustice and there's still oppression and people are still envious and uh, oh uh solomon is these things too right <laughs> and he can't he can't stop it yeah he can't end this all right and you can you can almost imagine the the frustration and the futility that he would be feeling knowing that he he can't do this Mm -hmm. he can't do this um and so this pushes us forward into the new testament right yeah Uh uh-huh yeah it's interesting to kind of think about that to try to get inside of his mind right i mean because he doesn't i mean there there's a messianic element there that's in that in the the covenant with david yeah and it's written about in several psalms Mm -hmm. that he would have had access to including psalm 2 yeah i'm sure i'm sure that his father told him Mm -hmm. like god has made me a covenant that one of my sons is going to sit on the throne forever and all nations are will serve (laughs) right 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 and here's solomon (laughs) yeah right you're not that guy pal yeah (laughs) you seen that (laughs) you're not that guy yeah he's not that guy yeah so uh yeah we have the benefit of reading this and that kind of his question was, uh, look at the tears of the oppressed. Like, mm. who's there to comfort them? Right. Well, we know the answer. Mm-hmm. It's Jesus is the one. Right. He's the one who will comfort the oppressed. Mm. And uh, Jesus comes, and uh, in his first 
uh, his first coming, he reads from the Isaiah, Isaiah scroll mm. in his hometown. He picks it up, and of course, providentially, this is the reading from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Mm. And then they're like, oh, awesome, you're here. Let's throw you off a cliff. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> How about we can be like, oh wow, sweet! That's finally, uh, finally here, the son of David. Yeah, let's throw him off a cliff. Like, right? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the townspeople. <laughs> but you know, then he starts his ministry, and um, in his first coming, Jesus actually deals with the big problem, which is the human heart. Mm. So he has to. Uh, he lives perfectly on our behalf, and therefore he is the perfect sacrifice, obeys his Father perfectly, dies for sinners, rises from the dead after three days, and now he does literally free people from bondage. You're enslaved to sin. If, you, if you're a sinner, you're enslaved to sin, and no one can set you free but the Son. The Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So you're freed from that bondage of sin and oppression. The heart issue is dealt with. Mm. Um and so that root problem, which causes envy, um, he fills that, mm -hmm. and only he could fill that. Solomon couldn't fill it, mm -hmm. but he fills it. Yeah. Um, but he's coming again. You know, the, the first coming was uh, not about crushing all injustice, right? It was about dealing with that which causes it in the first place. Yeah. Now, he's delayed as we know, because he is merciful and gracious, and he he's patient with us, and he wants all of his people to come to repentance. That there, God has a people, he's given to the Son, and they're from every nation uh, and people group on the planet. Yeah. And until they all come, he's delayed the second coming. Mm -hmm. Second coming comes, um, then it's, it's a time for justice. Justice and oppression will be smashed. They will be totally dealt with, right? But a really good news for the those that are oppressed, really bad news for the unjust and the oppressors. Right. Um, and I think Solomon, I think Solomon knew that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, I, I think he's trusting that God is going to fulfill his promises. It's not him. But someone's right. coming, and I, I couldn't help but think about Psalm seventy two while we were uh, we were talking mm -hmm. about this. L listen to uh, listen to just the uh, the first seven verses of this psalm, and this is of Solomon. Solomon wrote this, and I, I think he's writing it about the Messiah. He's mm -hmm. writing it in in uh, in hopes of this king. He says, "Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son." May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. You, you got it all there. Right. He, he brings justice. He crushes the oppressor, and he is enough. There, there is no, mm -hmm. there is no envy because the king himself is like the rain that, yeah, that falls on the people, and they have everything they that they need in him. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um. So that's that's good. That's, yeah. That's uh, it. It's it's good how uh, we see Ecclesiastes is pointing to Jesus. Uh huh. Because uh, it's it's so easy to. Just throw up our hands and say, "I have no idea what this is about." <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. That's good. So that's it. Well, where are we? Uh, where are we going next? So the next observation that he makes here uh, is really about, um, like, uh, loneliness mm -hmm. and companionship. Yeah. So we will probably go through the end of chapter four. Okay. So there's a, there's this weird uh, kind of like parable mm -hmm. beginning in verse 13 that uh, maybe I'll read some of it what people say about it they, okay. they have no idea what it means but <laughs> okay. that's pretty much what they say but I think it fits in with what he I I, I think I think you'll see uh, a couple of people outline it correctly yeah. that 
the whole thing is about loneliness okay. and companionship. Okay. Right. So the rich guy in the beginning of this who has nobody is similar to this king at the end that okay. people don't care when he dies and they'll uh, never rem- they'll never remember him anyway mm. because he he doesn't have any friends. Right. He has no advisors, he won't listen to anyone anymore. So it's kind of about loneliness and companionship. Okay. It's the famous one that says, you know, a three co- a <laughs> right. three strand cord is not easily broken. Mm-hmm. T- two are better than one. Right. That's that's this stuff. Yeah. Uh, how, how many how many places in the commentaries have been like we have no idea what these verses mean? Have you run across that a lot as you've been going through? Um only 3 chapters in it's happened a couple times. Okay. They say the these verses are of uh, really vague and <laughs> You know, people aren't people argue uh-huh. about what they mean and yeah. and how it fits into what he's saying overall. That gives you and a then, lot of confidence when people, you get up to preach, right? Right, and then <laughs> people and then people will stop. You know, uh-huh. a lot of people will stop before that section on the king. Uh-huh. But the problem is, chapter five begins a brand new thought. Yeah, it's about worship and right. God. Right, and so then, like, what do you have in thirteen? Yeah, through uh through the end of the chapters, this little yeah. thing, like. What's the if it's by itself like yeah what's the point but mm. if you take it I think if you take it with what yeah. precedes it right um then you you've got something similar yeah okay so well again uh, I, I'm not the genius here yeah right, right. I, I'm I'm just trying to read I'll read like yeah 500 outlines if you give me 500 I'll probably read them all um and uh, there's no agreement yeah so eventually at the end of the day you got to pick something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then say, okay, this is my preaching portion. Like, how do I make a sermon out of this? Right. You know? Yeah. But that's kind of the, he just moves so quickly. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the themes swing so quick. Oh, yeah. Like, we're talking about oh, yeah. desolation and <laughs> terrible stuff. And then he's like, right. hey, you know, uh, friendship's really good to have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, friendship is good to have? Well, yeah. let me tell you something. When you go to worship... <laughs> Um, watch your mouth. Right. <laughs> like, like you're changing you're changing themes so fast. Yeah. I can't, can't keep up. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's been helpful. It's been helpful, and these conversations have been helpful. So I hope that uh, this has been helpful for uh, for our listeners also. And I look forward to uh, to hearing more from the Book of Ecclesiastes. So uh, we uh, we do hope that uh, the the way in where which we're talking about these passages are um, are helping you to understand the book better because we know that uh, God works through the Scriptures and that it's through the Word of Christ that uh, that people are changed and conformed into His image, and that's our goal. So if this has been helpful, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share. Uh, get uh, get this out to, uh, to more people that maybe they'll be helped by the book of Ecclesiastes. Also, uh, as always, it is our hope and prayer that this will help you become more and more conformed to Christ, and we will see you next time. Bye.